Um, hello, everybody. My name is Laurent Elder, and I'll be moderating this panel. Just so you know, we're, we're giving an extra five minutes for people to get into the room because it is not exactly front and center at the event. So we expect that there may be a few um, stragglers to come in. So thanks for being patient. All right, we may as well get started. Um, so, welcome to the talk on future of work. Um, it's a it's a session that, that will mostly, mostly look, look at, at issues, issues around, around the future, future of work and vulnerable populations. Um, I guess one of the I, I sometimes like to know uh, what feelings are. Um, around the room on things. So I guess put up your hand if you think that um, in the future, robots will take over your job. One person? Huh. 50 years in the future or something like that. One person, that's impressive. All right, so put up your hand if you think um, technology or uh, advances in technology will actually give you more opportunities for work in the future. Huh, interesting. So there are, there are optimists here. That's good. Um, so we won't really talk about what is the, the pressing issue of, in a lot of the media and amongst policymakers of AI, automation, and, and jobs so much. But it is one of the reasons why um, this topic is quite often front and center. Um, ever since uh, Frey and Osborne in 2015, I think, um, came up with a study that said that 47% of jobs in America were vulnerable to automation. Uh, policymakers, researchers, um, everybody have been quite um, concerned uh, with this uh, topic to the point where you had uh, front page headlines around, you know, a world without work, uh, how technology is disrupting uh, or destroying uh, jobs was an MIT tech review um, title. But the reality is we don't really understand very well the relationship between technology and work. It is still something that we are trying to uh, get a better grasp of. There are definitely advances all the time. But if there's an area that I think we're, we're starting to get a better grapple with, it's the whole issue of um, micro work, the gig economy, and some of the types of jobs that uh, 
that essentially have appeared in the last five years and that you've all heard of. I mean, Uber is the best um, example of this. And um, it, it's kind of interesting because uh, to a certain extent, it's the first articulation of how uh, you know, an internet society is creating a lot of new jobs. I mean, some of the people on the panel will tell you a bit more about um, the, the, the amount of jobs this is potentially creating. But Mark, if I remember correctly, it was 10% uh, of Americans have actually uh, been part of a, a gig economy job, 8% and 10% in 10 percent in the UK. Um, but what's important to our panel is also the extent to which these jobs are permeating in the developing world. And we'll have around the table people who actually have done household surveys across Africa, Asia, and Latin America to understand um, the extent to which these types of jobs are playing a role in those places. Um, so that will be a large part of what we'll talk about, is essentially what kind of jobs are showing up in this new internet-enabled work environment, what are the opportunities, but also what are the challenges around them? What are the types of uh, labor protections? Uh, what are the types of uh, wages that should be expected in these kinds of situations? But another big part of the panel will be on how can people best prepare for those types of jobs? So how do we build digital skills? How do we build uh, a skills base that ensures that even the vulnerable people can take advantage of these types of opportunities. Um, so we have with us um, Alison Gilwalt from, from RIA, um, Carolina Cairo from LACNIC, uh, Mark Graham from the Fair Work Foundation, Alexia Zucchetti, and I may have massacred that, um, from Fundacion Ceibal, and Manuel Hassas from uh, Google, and they will each give us about five to seven minutes on what they're working on and some key findings uh, in this space, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, including you in the conversation and, and getting some sense of the key questions that uh, you have on these topics and just try to have a more informal conversation on this. So maybe Alison, I'll start with you. Um, the few remarks I'm going to make, I'm going to focus on Africa, but the data that I'm drawing on, the data set that I'm drawing on, comes from a um, Global South survey um, of over 20,000 households and double that um, individuals, who, um, which we did with um, Learn Asia in Asia and with um, Dersi in Latin America, now also Latam Digital. Um, I think what's sort of most remarkable about the study in Africa is that actually the, this was done in, during 2018. Um, and these are nationally representative household surveys. So they, the actual, they're the real penetration rates for, for Africa, not the supply side, you know, multiple SIM card kind of figures that you're seeing. So the penetration rates are far lower than the official um, sort of UN statistics suggest. And so I suppose therefore it's not so surprising that you've got such a low incidence of um, online work um, in Africa. Um, actually, across many of the countries, there was, it was sort of statistically insignificant. We actually couldn't use the data. So the data has been aggregated in some ways to make um, some sense of it, um, which also you know, shows, you know, it, it, it masks certain things about certain countries. But I think what is interesting is how, how you know, diverse it was um, across the different countries and how contextual the work that was happening in different countries um, and the uh, responses to on, online work. Um, 
So I think, you know, it, there's been a lot of um, hype about um, the potential of online work for, for, for decent work, that it can address some of the sort of misalignment we have between skills and resources in our economy, um, that it can provide sort of frictionless work and um, can provide people with, you know, m m mobility and those kinds of things. But as I said, in fact, um, there's this very, very low incidence um, you know, with penetration rates way below the critical mass to get sort of network effects, so way below 20% in many of the least developed countries of the um, 10 that we surveyed, um, you know, a country like Rwanda, which of course, you know, is a poster child of the, of the banks, has these incredible supply side policies, um, very strong gender um, policies, actually has the, had the lowest internet penetration rate of less than 10% and the widest gender gap of 60%. So in a country like that, it's really not surprising that we pick up you know, a statistically insignificant number of, of people actually doing micro work. Um, so until we actually get those um, you know, basic um, um, development issues addressed, we're not actually going to be able to see the benefits potentially of online work. But what we do see um, when we look, when we, when we um, in, interrogate the online work that's happening, is that um, in Africa, unlike um, Asia, even to some degree, but certainly in Latin, to Latin America, a lot of the online work is actually just platform um, sourced manual work. So the large majority of people who are doing online work are doing um, e hailing, domestic work, um, you know, gardening. And those, and those kinds of things, which is now being sourced online. And uh, certainly Mark will speak about how that is a whole lot better for some people, but it's also a whole lot worse for, for a lot of people. So, I mean, generally what we're seeing across the board is the patterns of exploitation, north-south exploitation, especially with um, LATAM, um, the LATAM survey, the um, DOSI survey, and um, Europe, for example, you know, Spanish workers in... Uh, um, in Latin America were paid much less if it, if it was identified, if they could be identified as Latin American workers, they were paid much less than Spanish workers doing the same job in Spain and those kinds of um, inequalities. And then of course, in, in the, on the manual side of, of, of work, a, a lot of the traditional exploitations as well. Um, and of course, there are these problems around quality control and who, do, you know, who does get paid and how they get paid for what they've done. But about 30% of the very small number of people who had actually done online work um, had stopped doing online work. Because, the reason for not continuing online work was because they hadn't been paid. So about 30%, which is significant, had not actually been um, um, paid for, for work before. Um, and then, of course, we, they're very interesting um, gender um, differences in the, in the different kinds of work that people are doing. So the idea that for um, you know, women, certainly in the literature from the uh, more mature economies, the idea is that you know, the, the, the um, evidence seems to suggest that online work really provides an opportunity for you know, child carers, people that are forced to be at home in, for various reasons, um, to do online work in a more flexible um, and, and, and better fashion. But in fact, um, because so few in many of these countries of women are even online, the possibility of them then doing that kind of work is further diminished by them being you know, very predominantly um, you know, not educated enough. That's one of the main reasons they're not coming online. It's one of the main reasons they're not allowed to do a whole lot of things online, are actually driven not per se by gender, but by per se, but, you know, by, the, by the fact that they are not getting access to education and therefore income, um, and therefore they're unable to either pay to be online and then to have the skills um, to do those jobs. Obviously, the fact that they're not getting educated, et cetera, these are all very cultural, gen engendered issues. But the actual determinants of being online and what you're doing um, is, is determined by that. Um, so perhaps I should just leave it there and come back to things if that's five minutes. Mark, do you want to go ahead? Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about a new project, the Fair Work Foundation. And um, the, the project is it's basically about ways of improving jobs in the gig economy. And when, it, when I say the gig economy, I think I'm talking about something a bit different than, than um, just online work. So I'm talking about also work that, that has to happen in a physical place. So this can be food delivery, this can be cleaning, this can be uh, care work, this can be taxi driving, and, and, and many other things. So 
um, just work that's mediated by a, a digital platform. Now, um, so what do we know about the gig economy? We know it's growing everywhere. We know that in cities all around the world, the, there's, there's, I, it would be hard to find a city anywhere on this earth where the, there's not platforms mediating all sorts of uh, local jobs. What do we also know about these jobs? We know that in many cases they're simply not good jobs. So the way that the, the model works is that instead of an employment relationship between an employer and an employee, what happens is that the, the digital platforms, they set themselves up as essentially a simple intermediary between the user or the consumer or the client and the worker. Um, so they don't employ the worker, but they treat the worker as essentially an independent business. So in some cases, this, uh, this classification of workers as independent contractors, it's genuine. The platform is essentially a version of the, the yellow pages. Uh, but in, in other cases, it's a clear case of misclassification. So what, uh, irrespective of whether the, this, this, so labor lawyers all around the world are arguing about this, but irrespective of whether this, this classification is legit or not, the, the point that I want to make is that um, workers are not classified as employees on almost all of these platforms, and so therefore they're not protected by any of the rights that they would have if they were employees. So what my colleagues and I have done is we've done years of research into the platform economy in, in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe, and uh, into the experiences of platform workers in those regions. So we, we've interviewed over 300 workers um, in countries that include Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, and then more recently here in Germany and in the UK. And in all of that research, we, we found a lot of benefits that accrue to platform workers. So most obviously just having a job, having income that they wouldn't have otherwise, but also more flexibility and more objective management for workers in some cases. But we also encountered a lot of issues. So lots of workers fall through the cracks. And when they do, because as I said, they're not employees, they're rarely protected by local labor law. And so uh, they can suffer. So. I'm not going to recount the full details of our research here, but the, the basic point is that this, this sort of work that I'm talking about, it's by definition precarious and insecure. Uh, it's often unsafe. I'm in a WhatsApp group of South African food delivery drivers, for instance, and they're, they're, they're always sharing messages about someone who's gotten injured, they're collecting money for their hospital fees. This weekend they were sharing pictures of a coffin and a funeral, one of them died on the road. Um, so. Uh, it, other issues are that in most cases there's an oversupply of labor power, which leads to vulnerability. There's low pay, sometimes below local minimum wages. Uh, there are workers who can experience explicit discrimination. Um, so for, um, uh, some experience wage theft. There's a lack of accountability generally for platforms. So workers can, for instance, be fired without any due process. And there's just generally an inability to collectively organize or bargain. So. Those are the issues, and those are kind of the starting conditions that we've, we've those are why we've founded our project, the Fair Work Foundation, and we, we've done it with some support from the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, and the European Research Council, um, as we're doing it in Europe, and then uh, starting soon, ID, IDRC's Future of Work program. And um, the point of this project then, again, is, is to kind of sidestep this this discussion about employment status and acknowledge that irrespective of how uh, a worker is classified, the, these platforms, these platform companies, they still have some control over the working conditions of their workers. And if, if they have that control over their working conditions, we can encourage them to improve those conditions. So the basic idea behind the project is we're trying to do four things. So first of all, we co-develop a set of principles, of uh, fair work principles with the people and with the organizations that they impact on. So primarily gig workers, but also uh, trade unions and platforms. What we then do is we take those principles and we carry out research to evaluate uh, platforms against those principles. And we use that research to give every platform a score, a fair work score. This is a score out of 10 that I'll, I'll explain in more detail in a second. And then we use that score as a pressure point to encourage fair work and discourage unfair work. And we, we've piloted all of this in India um, in collaboration with, with our partners, Triple ITB, 
uh, and in South Africa with our partners UCT and UWC, uh, and in the beginning RIA, um, who helped us get off the ground. Uh, so we, we piloted with these partners in the first instance, and this year we're, we're expanding it to Germany, uh, to the UK, and then some partners in Chile and Indonesia. So we've developed these five core principles that we think should apply to all platform work. So we're talking about fair pay. This means paying at least a minimum wage in a worker's jurisdiction, fair conditions, so uh, protecting worker health and well-being, fair contracts, so not, not misclassifying workers, um, fair management, this means having an appeals process for disciplinary procedures, and fair representation. So this means um, having a process through which worker voice can be expressed and recognizing collective bodies where they exist. So what we've done is we, we've worked to develop ways of measuring those principles and give each platform a score out of 10. And then, uh, so we, we, we give the platforms these scores. Uh, these scores are all on our website. If you're interested in, in seeing them, the website's just uh, fair.work, uh, easy to remember. And so we give every platform a scorecard, and then we put them all on a league table and where we can compare them against one another. So you can see how platform A compares to platform B. And that, so our theory of change there was that slowly over time, we might see more platforms uh, feeling pressure to score better than, than one another because of the league table that we're putting out. And we really try to encourage this by, we launched with a bang, we, we put this in a lot of media, um, we made the scores quite visible. What we didn't really expect is that when we sit down with some of the platforms to gather evidence about their scores, um, one of the questions that often comes to us is, what do we do to get more points? This is what the platforms will say to us. What do we do to score better? And so we've had platforms do things like implement minimum wages where they used to have any, implement living wages, implement safety training for workers, implement a works council in one case, agree to the formation of a trade union in principle, um, so the platforms have agreed to all of these things in our conversations in order to score uh, more highly in, in this, these league tables. So to, to sum this up, I think, you know, we, as, as Laurent said in the beginning, we, we know that without a doubt the, the digital revolution or um, digital transformations, it, it's without a doubt changing the, the landscape of work around the world. And I think what we really need to do is just ensure that the jobs are being created are good jobs and are decent jobs. And I think part of how we get there will be using research to, to not just understand platforms and understand how they work, but also using that research to make uh, working conditions in the gig economy more visible in a reproducible way and in a directly comparable way. So I think at the end of the day, platforms, they, they work and they, they profit by essentially being weightless and ephemeral organizations. They, they don't own assets, they don't employ workers, but I think that, weight, that weightlessness, it also renders them quite, quite vulnerable to alternatives, to competitors. They're, they're really sensitive to public opinion. They, they, only in, they only exist when we pay attention to them. They don't uh, exist unless we look at them through our screens. So what my hope is is that this project offers a way of holding platforms a bit more accountable. Platforms they can shape the quality of work, and uh, what we hope to do in this project is play our part to try to get them to acknowledge that and to live up to that responsibility. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. So you've gotten a sense of the, the kind of macro perspectives around online work, the, the gig economy, the platform economy. Um, now we'll hear from Carolina, who will tell us a little bit more about a, a micro case of trying to um, enable online work in Haiti. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Laurent, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so in my case, I represent LACNIC, the Regional Internet Registry for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and together with uh, support from IDRC, we have been working on an initiative called IT Goes Global uh, in Haiti. Um, IT was essentially a project that um, sought to connect young Haitian women with online employment opportunities. Um, and it, instead of a very, very summarized form, uh, we could say that the project uh, sort of developed in three stages. Um, the first thing we did was we mapped uh, job opportunities that program beneficiaries um, could do remotely from Haiti. And then we developed online training courses based on those uh, job profiles that we had identified. Then uh, we selected uh, some 350 uh, beneficiaries and had them complete this, um, this online training set that we developed. 
Um, and lastly, we worked uh, with program graduates um, in exposing them uh, to online talent platforms. Um, to give you a sense of what platforms I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, platforms such as Freelancer or Guru. Um, and uh, also just sort of generally provided uh, support um, to, to our beneficiaries on everything that had to do with professional development. So uh, mentoring support, um, efforts to help them secure internships and um, additional uh, training opportunities and topics such as uh, entrepreneurship and uh, coding. Um, there are two main lessons that, that we derive from, from this project um, that I think are relevant for the discussion today. Um, first, when, when we talk about future of work, one of the uh, sort of central topics I think that often comes up is this question of closing uh, skill gaps. So essentially thinking about how we can um, sort of develop or even upgrade digital skills effectively among those uh, local communities that are um, lagging behind. Um, and again, in our case, we selected 350 women uh, from low to middle low income households, and we had them go through these uh, online courses we had developed. Um, and what we saw was that um, in spite of uh, connectivity challenges and even um, uh, limitations to access uh, electricity in the context of Haiti, uh, we ended up having an 86% graduation rate and only a 3% uh, dropout rate in our courses. Um, so we feel the project proved, uh, first of all, that um, upgrading digital skills is possible um, in resource-constrained uh, environments. Uh, such as Haiti, and also that online learning um, can be uh, an effective mechanism for closing um, skills gaps. Again, even in complex settings such as Haiti, um, and obviously provided that, um, uh, that you sort of employ certain strategies that make those trainings uh, more effective. And I'm happy to share some more uh, thoughts um, or pointers as to what those strategies uh, may be during the discussion. Uh, the second big lesson um, from this project has to do with our efforts um, around um, our, uh, yeah, our efforts to connect women with online work opportunities. So here, while our on online trainings were uh, relatively successful or had good results, the results when exposing women to um, online platform was a, a lot more modest. Um, first. Uh, what we did was, in an effort to sort of mitigate infrastructure um, uh, barriers or challenges, we gave a group of program graduates access uh, to an office space with computers and connectivity. Um, and this group of beneficiaries um, only managed to develop two clients on one of the uh, talent platforms that they worked on, um, and they completed only a handful of online gigs during the life cycle of, of the project um, that, that we conducted. So essentially, here we started off the project um, uh, with this assumption that mitigating infrastructure and skills um, uh, deficits was sufficient to sort of level the, the, the playing field and allow uh, Haitian women to access uh, work online. So essentially make them as competitive as someone maybe based in India, someone maybe based here in Germany. Uh, but we found that there are other factors at play in Haiti, um, and we understand some of these barriers may also be playing um, a role in other countries across uh, the Global South. So I'm happy to share some of those findings uh, with you today. Um, so we have grouped these barriers into two subsets. We have uh, first what we call uh, platform barriers, which are somewhat documented already in existing literature. Um, and then we have um, what we have called uh, cultural or sort of preference um, related um, barriers. Uh, so among the platform barriers, um, we first have the question of uh, language skills. Um, here, well, Haiti is obviously French speaking, Creole speaking. Um, and here the lack of um, proficiency in English limited our beneficiaries' abilities to apply for bids even negotiate with potential clients. And when the, the bids um, or the gigs did come in, they also sometimes struggle to fully understand uh, job offers. Um, another limiting factor that we identified was lack of credit cards, other sort of financial tools to enable beneficiaries to um, receive money from clients abroad. Um, and this may seem like a very sort of easy to overcome barrier, but it was perceived uh, as sort of a, a major issue for, for our beneficiaries. So there's definitely a sort of a strong element connected to financial inclusion that I think um, uh, plays a role in, in, in this type of uh, initiatives. 
Um, we also had lack of prior work and experience and certifications. Uh, certifications are very important on online platforms, uh, like the ones I mentioned earlier, which essentially hurt both, um, on the one hand, credibility, but also confidence um, to, to apply for gigs and, and sort of placed our beneficiaries at a disadvantage compared to other online bidders. Um, and lastly, there is a question of time invested, and perhaps this is one of the, the points that's like mostly uh, covered in existing literature. Um, but essentially, the sort of unpaid time it takes to win, uh, be it lowers the income rate, um, and this, in, in our case, demotivated uh, the, the graduates that we were working with from, from applying to more bids. Um, and, and this last point really sort of ties into the cultural or preference related barriers that we also identified. Um, here, what, what we found was, again, we were working with women from low income households or uh, middle uh, low income households. And sort of in spite of financial difficulties that they faced, what we saw is that all our program graduates had, uh, had high ambitions uh, for themselves. Um, they wanted to continue with part-time or full-time studies. They aspired um, oftentimes to um, actually secure uh, more traditional jobs in the domestic market. Um, so essentially what ended up happening with the project is that as beneficiaries became aware of the time needed to um, bid online um, on, on, on these platforms, they made the economic decision to invest their time elsewhere. Um, so either looking for jobs in the domestic market or you know, continuing with their part-time education or even uh, prioritizing uh, household chores or domestic responsibilities that they had. Um, so having said that, um, I would like to sort of close on a positive note because I feel that you know, the findings that we've been discussing shouldn't uh, necessarily discour uh, discourage us from uh, engaging in efforts to strive for a more inclusive digital economy. Um, I didn't speak at, uh, about this at length, but our project was above all uh, a project uh, built around gender, right? We worked uh, primarily with women um, and we documented how the participation uh, of these women in our pro program really transformed power relations uh, for them. Um, and even though we did not have um, sort of significant results on the employment front, in our focus groups, and I think uh, Mark hinted at this a little bit, um, women reported to appreciate the opportunity to access uh, work opportunities overseas. Um, uh, as you know, there are not a lot of jobs available in the Haitian domestic market. Um, and they also appreciated uh, things that had to do with um, sort of flexibility of, um, you know, online work, which also allowed them to sort of pursue other pathways. Um, you know, a lot of, them, of our beneficiaries sort of diversify what they do. Um, and, and this is sort of closely related to, to, to the fact that, um, uh, you know, the economy is somewhat unstable in Haiti. So they sort of diversify, you know, what, what it is that they invest their time in and what they're involved in. Um, so, what, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, sure, entry barriers are high, but I, I think that projects such as uh, this one and discussions such as the one that we're having here today um, should allow us to develop um, better, a better understanding of the factors um, at play and, and also come up with uh, improved uh, workforce development strategies. Thank you. Thanks, Carolina. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Manuel, who... Um, is from Google, and we know that Google has played a big role in trying to uh, build these kinds of digital skills in a, in a scaled uh, way. And interestingly, they, they built, I think, a little bit from the experience in, in Haiti, um, where they did build data and digital skills by looking at how that experience went. So over to Manuel to talk a little bit about that. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to participate here. It is always an, an honor for, for us to, to be engaging in these meaningful conversations that we know are, are shaping how our lives are being transformed, our social and economic lives are, are being transformed worldwide. First of all, let me start that, for that, that we, we recognize that the internet is a huge boon for, for the economy. Uh, it has created worldwide uh, massive uh, uh, development and it's changing the way economic situations and economic relations are being shaped today in the world. Um, let me say that we are just only starting to see the beginning of, of how these technologies are changing, uh, uh, creating economic uh, opportunities across physical industries and creating change 
in traditional industries such as manufacturing, agriculture, transportation, among others. Um, for example, one finding that, that we are still seeing in, in the world is that a recent study found that the ability to rent IT as needed uh, on time is partic uh, particular via cloud computing was associated with significant higher survival and growth among young uh, manufacturing plants. And the development of, of machine learning technologies and AI for, uh, for being more specific holds great promise in, in improving standards of living. For example, we are seeing uh, doctors using AI to, to find a better diagnosis. Uh, via uh, to find breast cancer tumors, skin cancer, and these advances in health are just the tip of the iceberg. But what does this mean for, for traditional jobs or for jobs who require um, certain specific skills or uh, routine tasks uh, uh, to be performed? This is being changed and transformed in so many ways. Um, since these technologies allow for more, for more um, uh, productivity to be achieved, some, some of these uh, tasks uh, which are uh, recurring and, and, and which, which need to be implemented uh, on, a, on a recurrent basis are starting to be fading out of, of, of the scene. Uh, this may displace some jobs, but may also create other jobs. So transformation is not new in this sense. And when these jobs are, are starting to be transformed, there, there, there are uh, opportunities for more creative jobs which are related as good jobs uh, to, be, to be more in place in that sense. Uh, for example, in the 18, uh, 19th century, almost 70% of Americans and Europeans work as farmers, whereas now only 2% does. So what does this mean? It means that, the, that, that these jobs with, which were um, recurring and manually intensive are now being transformed and, and are now introducing technologies to to actually, to actually make that uh, less labor intensive and more intellectually uh, intensive. But on the same time, we recognize that the economy isn't working well for everyone, and we recognize that, that this has uh, challenges implicated. And for example, all that my colleagues have, have already mentioned, the gig economy and new platforms are part of, of a growing trend of work done independently. And this raises questions and raises uh, concerns. Uh, but, but also gives the need to present the false uh, dichotomy that, that the robots and AI uh, technologies are going to steal our works. Work is only being transformed in that sense, but uh, new, new challenges are, are being arise on that, uh, because of that. Uh, Google thinks that we need to, to focus on, on, on some things, some very four specific things. We need to rethink uh, education. Education and workforce development have lagged changes in technology. We need to really include these changes as early on as possible from, from uh, elementary education, secondary education. We know that children in secondary education right now will, 60% uh, of, the, of, of the children worldwide in, in secondary education and elementary schools, 80%, uh, will, be, will be working on jobs which right now they don't, don't exist. So there is a, a huge challenge here to integrate uh, non-traditional works and thinking ahead on, on, on how the economy is going to be set for the next uh, 30 years. Uh, we need to also think on, on reducing dependency to work on traditional uh, uh, companies and start fostering more entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, this is something which Google has, has already been focusing on a lot in, in Latin America. There are, uh, I don't have uh, aggregated figures, but for example, I can say that in Mexico, Last year, we trained 80,000 people in entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship skills. We have a variety set, set of programs uh, from, uh, called aggregated within one uh, umbrella program called Grow with Google, which uh, tries to aim for digital skills. And we have a set of uh, open courses, free available courses on internet called Garage Digital uh, and Google Primer, which are holistic um, digital economy courses for creating, uh, building skills in, in, in entrepreneurs. And these are uh, very quick ways on, on how anybody can uh, depend less on traditional companies and depend less on, on, on traditional jobs and actually start building something as a, with, with an, an, entrepreneur, an entrepreneurship spirit. Um, we need also to update social programs because tech 
don't, they doesn't necessarily benefit everyone equally in that sense, and, and we are thinking on how to, how to uh, update uh, our uh, job laws and, and how to update uh, norms in, in the countries w where we operate. Because um, technology is also, is also um, creating some, some uh, uh, brackets of low-wage low work and that's, that's where we are seeing a, a certain uh, polarization. Companies are benefiting from, uh, from acquiring uh, engineers and, and hire people with, with higher skills, but there is a bracket where, where we are not including new people. And for example, something that we have seen in Latin America is that there is a specific lack of, of, of IT maintenance uh, and and IT uh, within the IT sector. I mean, not programming jobs, but people who can actually solve technical problems and, and solve uh, IT equipment uh, uh, tech issues. Uh, in that sense, we launched in Latin America last year, uh, along with the IDB, the IT uh, certificate uh, program, which aims to train one million people, one million uh, people uh, from the ages from, of, of uh, 20 to 30 years. Specifically in in tech, tech and, and IT maintenance uh, services, which is something that the current companies are lacking. And well, other things that we have done in Latin America is we have invested in, in programs for young people between 16 years and 24. Uh, for example, the program that that Carolina was was mentioning. Uh, th that bracket, that age bracket represents 25% of, of the workforce in, in the Caribbean, in the English-speaking Caribbean. And in that sense, a way to, to include these, these uh, people who are not neither uh, studying, neither working, is you can provide uh, very specific IT, IT uh, ability skills. In that sense, um, data, Mm, data managing and, and big data analysis is something where we see a, a growing trend. We need people who can be able to analyze uh, big data and, and, and aggregate, and who can actually create some specific skills for them to be able to engage in, in, in entrepreneurship uh, skills and, and in, in gig economy. Um, in two years, we, we achieved to train at least 1,000 and uh, 1,500, I'm sorry, disadvantages, uh, risk around those ages from 15 to 24. And imagine what, what this means to, the, to, a, to a growing economy. We have data that in Latin America, when we manage to get a company or w when we manage to get a small or, or medium-based uh, company online, their productivity increases in 15% just in the, in, in the first year that they are connected. And also in the first year, they manage to expand their market for, for export in 35%. So in that sense, what, what we are aiming to do is to create uh, a regional integrated uh, economy and to have people to be able to work with a, with a specific sets, sets of, of skills in an online world and, and, and in a hyper-connected world where a job is, is, uh, could be located anywhere and where you can have a demand uh, for workforce coming from other countries and uh, for people in Latin America to be able to have the skills to actually uh, fulfill that, that job demand that, that is being requested. So I should leave it that, that way. Thank you very much, Manuel. And last but not least, we have uh, Alexia, who um, is from Fundación Ceibal in, in Uruguay, which is a, a really uh, interesting organization and has worked on issues around uh, education and, and skills building, and she will tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, as uh, in fact, yes, I'm going to focus specifically on the case of Uruguay and on the digital inclusion program of the country, which is named uh, Plan Ceval. Uh, I'm part of the foundation which uh, handles research in education and technology uh, and the foundation was created actually by uh, Plan Ceval. Uh, well, the program was actually uh, created in 2007 at a very early stage with the goal of bridging uh, the digital divide in the country. 
and uh, despite Uruguay was, is one, uh, is, it uh, still is one of the most equal countries of the region, the digital divide uh, that the country faced in 2006, one year before the creation of the program, was directly related to the socioeconomic context. Uh, during those, uh, during that first uh, year, actually, uh, the digital divide was um, six, only six percent of the population uh, at the lowest socioeconomic level had access to a device at their home, uh, in relation to a 49 percent in uh, the highest uh, socioeconomic level. After only three years of implementation, uh, those percentages uh, reached uh, 60 and 65 percent, respectively. And uh, the interesting issue about this is that, um, well, Plan Ceibao is part, uh, was the first action in order to favor digital inclusion in the country, but it was also part of a wide uh, inter-institutional strategy that includes many other organizations in the country uh, that worked across different fronts in order to effectively integrate um, digital technologies uh, across every field in society, economy, etc. Uh, education was the first area and uh, and Saibao, during its uh, nearly 14 years of existence, it has not only focused in initially creating the, um, providing access and creating the necessary infrastructure for, um, well, for allowing people to connect, students and teachers mainly, to connect to the internet and providing them with devices, but it moved forward and it adapted to the changes that uh, information society has shown in the past uh, few years. And so during this, uh, let's say, second and third phase of development, uh, it focused specifically in digital skills, in, in, in including digital skills for teachers and for students. Uh, it actually, nowadays, it uh, has nearly 700,000 beneficiaries, uh, which include students from preschool to uh, secondary school and teachers across uh, the whole country. It has also focused in uh, a large number of programs in order to foster digital skills development and training, um, in areas as coding, robotics, uh, 21st century skills, um, well, digital and data literacy, uh, among many others, as well as uh, research across all those areas. And uh, a program that I would like to, to point out, and that is particularly related to uh, digital skills training and, and the importance of digital education for the future of work, uh, is uh, called uh, Youth to Code. And it has been uh, implemented for the past uh, nearly three years. And the program is uh, a clear example of an alternative and informal uh, educational model. It's not part of uh, the formal educational training, but it was created um, along with all the main companies and enterprises working in the IT industry in Uruguay, which is one of the uh, most, um, the, the highest, uh, the, well, the, the let's say, the most competitive industries in the country that show a very good performance uh, during the past few years. And the program uh, is focused directly on the needs of those companies. And it has trained so far uh, nearly 1,500 uh, 1, uh, boys and girls from uh, 18 to 30 years old in coding, software development, um, and these were uh, all profiles that, junior profiles, that companies actually required in Uruguay. And during this past year in particular, and due to um, well, uh, different service and research that was conducted um, during the previous two years, uh, the program decided to focus only on women. Because during those first two years, uh, and despite the fact that 50% uh, of women 
access the program and were admitted, during the first few months there was a higher dropout uh, in women in relation to men. And therefore, uh, after uh, research and surveys, um, it was, uh, there was, uh, th this was related to their perception in relation to their uh, male peers. And therefore, this year, the program focused specifically on women. And so far, uh, we can see that their, uh, the, high, the, the dropout rates have uh, reduced. So, um, and I would like to, to end up with a few conclusions. First of all, that regarding at least digital uh, education and digital skills, um, there's, as uh, actually Manuel mentioned, um, educational, educational systems need to rethink themselves. And in many cases, and during the past few years, alternative and informal educational models, especially in this area, such as coding, um, um, software development, IT maintenance have been developing and they are showing that uh, they are more effective in uh, bridging the gap between education, uh, skills and employability. Educational systems actually during uh, the past few years, as we all know, due, due to many reports, um, even from, well, the World Bank is, uh, is the, the last one, um, are going through a very, uh, well, a crisis, a learning crisis, even in providing uh, students with the basic skills that they need to enter the job market. Then, uh, on a second basis, uh, there's also, there are also very few programs specifically focused on digital skills and, um, and uh, providing students and also teachers with the skills in order to enter the job market or the, the skills that they will need in the, in the forthcoming years. Uh, so those are um, a few considerations and there is also um, the need to uh, have more research about uh, which are the skills, the specific socio-technical skills that the job market will require in the years to come because otherwise we are, uh, educational systems in general are preparing students without actually knowing which are the, the requirements in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now over to you, any questions, comments? Reactions, absolutely. Um, so two or three comments, if I may. Um, I, I have a sort of curious history here because I started as an historian of labour markets in Africa and, and now write about information society issues. Um, so I kind of bring the two together. I think, um, and I just want to raise three points. Um, one is to do with um, uh, employment rights and the sort of transition that, you're, that we're seeing at the moment towards platform type jobs and in the longer run towards whatever we come from, AI and so forth. And I think the starting point should be an admission that we simply don't know what's going to happen and that is the right starting point to have rather than trying to spin it one way or another. Um, but I do think within that there is a context in which, and I'm very much behind what Mark is trying to do with the Fair Work Foundation, um, uh, which is ultimately mitigating the gig economy. Uh, but I think there's, um, you know, we, we, if you look historically at this, what you're seeing as modern uh, employment relationships, because they're digital and digital is modern, as we kind of see it, um, actually they're very like piecework in the 19th century. Um, and many of the um, problems that arise for workers uh, are similar to the problems that peace workers had in the 19th century. Um, they're certainly a lot uh, weaker in terms of rights than what is in the International uh, Covenant on uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And it would be quite nice if the rights community at a place like this, uh, uh, like the IGF, also addressed employment rights. My, my second um, point is really to do with digital skills. Um, so, and there's a kind of, I think there's a kind of cognitive disjunction here. Um, so we don't know what will happen with AI and jobs in the long term, um, but we make assumptions that uh, digitalization will change the nature of employment and employment prospects. And that is clearly, going to be right, even if we don't know the, the details of it. Um, 
And so there's an emphasis in um, what policymakers are doing on digital skills. Um, however, if you read much of the literature around, well, uh, from enthusiasts for um, post-AI kind of employment scenarios, a lot of that is about, well, of course, what will happen is that people will move towards doing those jobs that machines can't do, that is, the caring and creative professions. Well, firstly, the caring and creative professions don't require digital skills, they require non-digital skills, and I know of no uh, government policy for employment in the digital age which is focusing on non-digital skills of that kind. Um, and secondly, they are, of course, uh, among the lowest paid occupations that there are. Uh, so that also feeds into a kind of likelihood of, of, of diminution of employment rights and, and incomes. And I suppose the last point I'd just make is that I mean, it's often said that, that you know, uh, this is a great opportunity for employers and governments to improve the quality of services because of greater efficiency. My sense is that actually what governments in particular will do will bank the efficiency savings in terms of cost minimization and do very little in terms of the quality of jobs. Um, yeah, this is Steve Zeltzer from LabourNet in San Francisco. Um, I find it kind of striking here that uh, this panel here has a representative from Google, which I'm in favor of, but no labor representative, no union representative. Why wouldn't you have somebody from a union and for labor giving a perspective from labor? Strange. And I find that problematic in this whole IGF conference that we're at. There are very few panels. There are no panels. In fact, this is the, discussing the, the, full, uh, the conditions of labor global, uh, <coughs> globally. And I think this is, I think, uh, a dangerous thing because globally, the marginalization of the working class as a result of digitalization has had a massive impact. In the Bay Area in San Francisco, uh, gig workers, Uber workers, you have homeless, you have mentally ill, they're cutting social services. People have seen the film Joker. Uh, you know, that is what's happening in the United States. And it's creating a great social crisis. Um, the other thing that's happened most recently is the Google workers have been trying to organize and they've been fired for trying to organize. And within Google, you have a tiered structure where some workers get the full benefits, the perks, and other workers are third, fourth class contracted out who have difficult living conditions. Uh, so for a company that says it wants to change the world, uh, it raises questions of how you want to change it. And I think that the, um, for another example, we talk about education. Um, Google education uh, is supposed to help people, but in fact, it has been used to spy on students, on teachers, and also it's uh, supplanting public education. So although the program is free, uh, public, uh, public schools, public education is uh, basically being taken over by Google in the United States. Uh, and it's offered as a free program. You can do your documents, you can do your training, your research on, on Google. Who controls it? Who owns it? Who benefits from it? It's the Google Corporation, it's the people who own Google. And at the same time, another aspect of this whole digitalization, who benefits from digitalization but the owners of Google, the, these companies. In California, they're cutting the budget in education, public education, closing schools. At the same time, Google gets away without paying taxes and shifting money uh, of these billionaires who own Google uh, so that they're not responsible for the social costs uh, of society. So these are basic fundamental questions of the future of labor uh, globally. What is the future of labor under these circumstances uh, that need, I think, to be uh, looked at seriously? Okay, so let's start with those really easy comments. Um, I always like having a historian in the room because that is also my background and um, I think it's always important in these conversations to to have that point of view. Um, I also think that the comment about having a, a labor perspective is extremely important. I think one of the most influential books that I had read, it's almost 10 years ago now on, on these issues, was from Jack Chu, who uh, wrote the um, Working Class Network Society. Um, and he was one of Manuel Castell's students. And he had already seen in China that what's happening in this digital world is there's a digital underclass being created and the class system is being uh, 
uh, recreated in, in the digital world. And to a certain extent, it would seem that some of our, our panelists are, are um, suggesting that this is happening in uh, the gig economy in the digital world overall. So, um, panelists, do you want to take on some of those comments? So, uh, thank you for those really, really interesting and important questions. Um, I'm not, I might not address them directly, but I, th I did want to sort of raise the challenges around um, enforcement of, you know, basic labor rights and, um, you know, generally rights in, in general in the, in the context of the sort of failure of um, cross-jurisdictional law at the moment, the failure of multilateral organizations to be able to do any kind of coordination around this. And, you know, the need to look at more formal efforts of mitigation. So, I mean, I think obviously one has to do what one can where one can, but the problem with um, some of the more responsive platforms to the Fair Work Foundation stuff is it's obviously the platforms who are more concerned with those kinds of issues. So, you know, Sweepstake, for example, it's been a very good um, performer in terms of that has a really strong tradition of trying to support, you know, it's taking sort of domestic labor online was part of a positive attempt to, to get people to do that. So it's really about how we make the non-compliant um, companies conform. And so, I, you know, I think that this is the important part of us really trying to look at issues of global governance beyond the very sort of narrow um, spheres that we do. So we come into IGF and then we look very narrowly at this kind of you know, uh, narrow notions of, of, of internet, and then we go off to another forum and look at something else. And so I, th I think we really need to think more creatively about it. So for example, we've had issues where um, uh, South African uh, workers try to take Uber to court around labor um, rights. Um, and, uh, you know, South Africa has a very progressive um, labor regime, and they try to get, you know, um, address the issues in, the, in a South African court, and it would have been incredible precedent, um, and the courts ruled that the company was not present in South Africa, was registered in Brussels, the case had to go to Brussels, the um, pro bono lawyers were not going to be able to defend the case in a, a, a Brussels, you know, in a Belgium court, etc. So that's, you know, that's the problem with that. And then, as I said, you know, even, even in, the, in, in that environment, the distinction between the um, Uber drivers at large, Particularly, it seems those that are carrying passengers. So Uber seems to have a particular obligation where their passengers involved, and they provide a whole lot of protections, insurance, and all sorts of things to those drivers. But these delivery drivers, for example, have no protections. They don't have as high a bar to go in, so they're often actually a liability to themselves on the road. But also, of course, you know, to others, they have no none of the same protections. So there's an enormous inequality in those things. But just re re returning to the jurisdictional issues is I think because we, you know, the law is going to take a long time to catch up and we're going to have to find these sort of key places where we can get precedent, I think we have to look at um, you know, these multiple f forms of global governance that people are using in order to try um, and, and get a sort of global response to some of these uh, global platform um, issues that, that concern us. And so I think we really need to be looking at um, you know, the way that um, G20 and OECD, et cetera, are suggesting um, uh, taxation at the, at the global level you know, for platforms that will ensure that the, the platforms actually pay legitimate taxation, which actually will also um, provide some relief to the you know, irrational taxation through social networking in very poor countries um, on the wrong people um, for, those, for those things. And sort of le legitimate taxation that can be obviously very easily done in a, a you know, big data, um, uh, artificial intelligence environment where people immediately, yeah, that data, we know exactly how much revenue is actually coming from Google in South Africa, and it's either a flat rate or they pay the rate in South Africa, which is a very high rate. But this is particularly important because you know, if we're talking about the future of work and we're talking about more people coming online, what we're going to see is greater visibility of people online, self-employed and informal people online. Um, and obviously one wants to make, you know, one can ensure that the sort of extractive nature of um, taxation, et cetera, in, in, in particularly in developing countries doesn't happen again, but it does enable um, self-employed people and of course, 
people running platforms but at, who are present at a, at a national level to, to come online for those tax, taxes to be used in a way that could provide social protection, not necessarily to those direct workers in that platform, but in terms of um, you know, general safety nets, labor safety nets that could be provided that are never going to really be enforceable um, at an individual level, at, you know, at, at, a, at a global level at an individual company, um, but might be, be able to begin to be a, a basis um, in a digital economy for um, you know, a general safety net tax that could then be used for, for people. So I think, you know, I think the, 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 the fact that you know, there's visibility it's going to give um, informal sector workers, online workers, and of course these big platform companies put, is really needs to be thought about in terms of what can be done in a more integrated way. I can weigh in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. yeah actually, uh, very interesting. Um, and, and you actually mentioned it uh, very right. You know, the, the tax issue, the, the tax example is, is one of how, is, is one which can actually illustrate very much better how we need uh, new, new rules, new forms of, of coordination. For example, I, uh, I can speak too much about the, the case in, uh, within California because I'm not based there and, and I don't have the, the specific nuance. But for the case of Mexico, I, I can clearly speak about it because it's, it's my day-to-day -day basis. Um, for example, in Mexico, 90% uh, of, of, of Google's uh, business comes from, from, ad, from ad serving. And that is being uh, fully taxed because it is operated by a Mexican company, which is Google Mexico Operaciones. Uh, so in that sense, it is compliant. But what happens with the other 10% of the business that, that is uh, being offered directly from Google LLC in Mount View, California? And those are the rules which are being currently discussed within the, the, the OCDE, the, the OECD. And we need a global framework for, for us to know how to operate locally in, in, in each country because, you know, we at Google create global products which are being served in 100 or, or 200 countries. And we need it is very difficult for us to be, uh, we need to comply, and, and we do comply with all the laws that are uh, current in, in every country where, where we operate. And for us, a uh, worldwide way of coordination, for example, the, the principles that the OECD is creating and, and a specific framework and unique framework for us to, ha to know how to operate is better than be complying with all, um, with all the 200 laws which might differ uh, b between them. So that's, that's why we, we, we want to engage in these conversations and when we want to encourage policymakers to create laws, similar laws which are created uh, on an equal basis and on the sense of have a better coordination for this global economy which, uh, which uh, for the case of Mexico, tax laws are from 1970s and they just are in the process of being updated to the digital economy and, and it's a good thing. We, we want to pay taxes, we, we pay all the taxes that, that that we need to pay or, or that must be paid. And in that sense, what we only are requesting is to have clear guidance on how to, how to do it. And that it's a, a job which should, should come from the governments with participation of all stakeholders. And, and yeah, to, to tackle the other question, I think it's a very good comment. Um, new skills, well, I think that in the future, it's, it's correct to say that, that um, jobs I think it's going to be a mixture between a combination of, of traditional activities uh, implementing new technologies. Like the example that, uh, I was mentioning, doctors now detecting cancer using AI. It is something that, well, the doctor will still need to be trained in, in, in physical and, and uh, physical education and, and will need to obtain its MD, for example. But we'll also need to know how to, in to integrate these new technologies to detect cancer. And that's where, where the future is very promising because you're going to see whole new traditional uh, activities integrating uh, technology and making the, their work m more easy, more feasible to do. Um, yeah, it, 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 maybe I will build on that a little bit because I think that the, the question that David raised around what are 21st century skills? How do we define them? Um, the number of acronyms that are used is mind-boggling. Is it STEM? Is it STEAM? Is it STEM with two M's? Is it none of those things and just being a hairdresser? Um, 
because cutting hair is supposedly something that a robot will never be able to do. Um, we really don't know. So I wonder if, if colleagues from um, Fundacion Seibar and LACNIC might want to speak to that. Thank you. Yes, actually, I, I believe it. it is a very good comment. Um, we have been working, for example, in Uruguay in, of course, in promoting digital skills, but without losing that, uh, the sight on the fact that critical thinking, on how we need to foster, for example, traditional skills, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, uh, problem solving, which are uh, pillars of, uh, of our societies in general on, and of education uh, in general. So um, I do think that um, in the future and uh, the jobs of the future will require a combination of both. Uh, of both types of skills, there has been quite an attention in the in the past few years from policymakers, from IT companies, and many others uh, on digital skills development. But uh, and despite there are many uh, relevant frameworks from, for example, the U the OECD has been was one of the first. Uh, organizations to work in this European Commission as well with uh, lately uh, a coalition, the Digital Skills and Job Coalition and others. Uh, there, are, there is still a, a lack of research in the area and there's, there are, there's still the need to map the skills uh, to test the skills and to measure them, to create indicators, metrics, and others. And, and I think that, uh, well, at, in research in the area, we have been trying to work across that because that uh, is a necessary pillar in order to be able to speak about the future of work in the coming years and, and the role that digital education can play uh, in it. Um, yeah, well, I also wanted to tie this question uh, to, to this idea that uh, Laurent brought up about creating, you know, this digital underclass, you know, when, you know, perhaps you get that sense when we tell you we're, we're um, you know, looking to, to connect Haitian women with micro work opportunities. Um, and this is, uh, you know, an aspect that we struggle quite a bit with um, our project and, and, and that we, um, you know, sought to, you know, explore. Um, and I think it's very important for programs also to think about upward mobility, um, and, and this goes both for you know projects, you know perhaps of sort of more um, limited uh, scope, like um, our pilot initiative, and, and perhaps you know it's something that you know goes to um, uh, governments or even private sector when they're uh, planning um, uh, workforce development uh, strategies. Um, and here the idea, something we did with our program graduates was, um, you know, we saw the micro work as sort of a stepping stone for them to start considering careers in technology. And, um, you know, I spoke about how we work to sort of expose them to online platforms, but we complemented actually um, all, all that work with um, mentoring, um, with, um, uh, sort of exposure to sort of uh, additional trainings that would allow them to take the next step and say if one of them, I don't know, took an interest in, after doing this sort of basic uh, training, took an interest in, in coding and programming, they could, you know, pursue and see a career path in technology. So I think having an eye um, on, on that and on, on upward mobility again and, um, and, and uh, other opportunities that lie in the digital economy is also important. Again, going back to the question of thinking of marginalized uh, communities and you know, what opportunities we can bring to them. Uh, thanks, thanks for the comments. Maybe if I can just sort of briefly tie, tie my response to a few of them. Um, I think just, just building on what, what David said, I think it's important to point out that the, what you might think of as the, the, um, the standard employment relationship, it's, it's not the historical norm, of course. It's, it's not even the uh, global norm. It, it's the, the, this far more prevalence of this relationship of an employment contract between an employer and a worker in, in the global north and the global south. So it's, it's sort of a blip in, in space and time in a way. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, but I also think when, it, when I speak to platform companies, they're also very quick to point this out. When, when I speak to gig, 
economy companies. They, they're quick to point this out when, as they want to describe their workers as self-employed, as freelancers, as entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, I, I think we can get a bit lost in some of this, this debate in, in, in these labor law debates when, when we, we have these debates about which box to put workers into. Are they employees? Are they freelancers? And, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely important that, you know, labor law is important for a reason. It protects workers. We need it to protect workers. Um, but I think the platform model shows that, that there, there's, there's sort of a limit to the, the traditional classifications when, as, as are being applied to the gig economy. Um, so, you know, a lot of the debate centers around how do we get these workers reclassified as, a, as employees rather than freelancers so that they're covered by uh, protections. And I think that one of the reasons there's, you, you see a limit to this in, in somewhere like the UK where a lot of people say, well, what we actually need is we need to rethink labor law. We need a third category in the middle between employee, between independent contractor. Well, we actually have this in, in the UK, and it doesn't stop platforms from still classifying everyone as an independent contractor because they, they have very expensive lawyers who configure the contracts in such a way so that the workers, the, all the, the risk and the liability of doing that work is, is placed onto the worker. So I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the, at the moment, there's, there's sort of a limit to what we, we, we can do in sort of arguing in this space. But I also think it's clearly a, it's clearly a fiction that all of the, these workers, that they're, that they're sort of creative workers, that they're entrepreneurs, that they're self-employed, a lot of these gig economy workers, that they're vulnerable, they're extremely low paid. Um, and to, to, get to, to get your point, that it's, it's extremely hard to organize them. It's extremely hard for them to organize. In some places it's worked, in, in, in s there's, there's, there's been a few examples where you've seen successes, but you've seen a lot of failures. You've seen a lot of trade unions not wanting to touch the gig economy. You've seen a lot of uh, gig workers, uh, the second they, they start to, to try and organize, the, the platform deactivates them, and that they, they, they have no right to get back on it because they, they're, they're a self-employed worker legally. Um, so I, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is here uh, that, that we, we clearly need more protections for gig workers, but we, I guess we need to also think more creatively about what those protections can be rather than just thinking about the, the classification debate. Um, we need ways of, of, of sort of allowing gig workers to collectively organize. In some places that's illegal because, precisely because they're not employees. So I think that that's the job for, for all of us, is to, to think about what, the, what protections make sense in, in this new relationship where, where the, the gig company, the platform, sits in between this relationship between the user and the, the consumer. What, what responsibilities should we be putting on them? The answer is not none, but I think the, the answer is also um, we need to rethink the traditional employment model as well. Thanks, Mark. Um, we've actually pretty much run out of time. Um, and Kevin, our, our rapporteur, is um, going to, I think, try to sum up a little bit the conversation in a, in a few minutes. But um, a few of the things that uh, I'd like to take away from this is, one, that this is a fascinating field because the, the issues are extremely important. We have to redefine uh, labor protections in this new environment, but also we're dealing with great unknowns. We don't really understand uh, what will happen in the future with respect to technology and, and jobs. Um, so there is a need for our more research on these issues. Easy for me to say, being a research funder, but just to say this is, this is a key thing that I think we all need to do. So Kevin, over to you. Thanks very much, Laurent. Um, so we started this session looking at some of the perceptions around um, the future of work and digitalization. Um, statistics such as 47% um, of jobs in America that were vulnerable to automation. Um, there were headlines about how technology was drawing jobs. Um, these opening statements basically painted um, the environment of uncertainty around um, digitization and, um, and the future of work on digital platforms. 
We heard from Alison, who referred to her work in Africa um, they, and studies she had done among households. Um, these studies were able to demonstrate that real penetration rates um, were actually quite low as opposed to some of the proxies that were used. Low incidence of online work in Africa, some of the data was unusable, but at the same time, um, the responses across um, the continent were quite um, diverse in terms of how well um, um, digital work was actually um, being taken up. Um, despite the hype, um, there was not enough uh, penetration rates of digital work to achieve critical mass and to get the benefits. Um, Alison gave the example of Rwanda, which had about a 10% internet penetration rate and a gender pay gap of around 60%. Um, there were similar patterns of exploitation across the South when it came to Latin America. There was an example of Latin American workers um, within Europe getting paid uh, less than Spanish workers. Um, there was also um, statements about um, gender differences, um, especially where literature points to a more mature economy suggesting that online work provides opportunity um, for women to also have childcare and have employment, but um, there are other conditions to, to women um, accessing online work, including um, access to education, um, which tended to be low, therefore, um, and income levels, which um, are determinants for them being online. From Mark, um, on the Fair Work Foundation, um, he spoke about their project to improving jobs in the gay economy. Um, and not just jobs that happened online, but jobs that happened in a physical space that were mediated by technology. Um, he spoke about his research that uh, was used to score, to come up, sorry, co-develop sets of principles um, to evaluate platforms against each other and to be able to give these platforms a score out of 10. Um, these core principles included fair pay, fair conditions, fair contracts, fair management, and fair representation. Um, and the scores are available on the Fair Work Foundation's website. Um, one of the benefits of this scoring and publishing um, was that uh, platforms were able to approach um, and ask um, how they can do better, how they can score better. Um, and in the medium term, there were recommendations such as implementing minimum wages, implementing safety training, and there was also one case um, where there was an agreement to form a trade union. Carolina from LACNIC um, spoke about um, LACNIC's collaboration with the IDRC on a project called IET Coast Global. Um, she spoke about the three phases of this project, um, firstly being the mapping of job opportunities and beneficiaries, also um, the creation of courses that were tailored uh, to the beneficiaries based on the profiles that were developed, and then um, the last component which was working with program graduates to expose them to platforms and give them general support for professional development. Carolina outlined um, two main issues um, when speaking about future of work and closing skills gaps. Um, in the case of this Haiti project, um, many of the 350 women um, that were beneficiaries came from low to middle income households and they overcame a number of challenges including connectivity. Um, but despite all of that, um, there was an 86% graduation rate among those cohorts and a 3% dropout rate um, demonstrating that upgrading digital skills is possible um, despite constraints and um, women were more than willing to explore and exploit um, online opportunities. Carolina spoke about entry barriers on two fronts. Um, platform barriers which dealt with um, practical considerations such as lack of language skills, the ability to understand contracts, the ability to have um, financial instruments such as credit cards or accounts to receive money abroad, um, the lack of certifications and work experience which hurts credibility and confidence to apply for gig jobs compared to other online competitors. And Carolina also touched on some of the cultural barriers uh, to these young women accessing jobs 
Um, but despite the cultural barriers and these um, platform barriers or the practical limitations, um, the project proved to generally uh, engender a sense of inspiration for the women. They diversified their opportunities. They sought to also continue studying and uh, use their training for, for other um, types of endeavors. Manuel? Right. So, getting to the meat of it. <laughs> um, let's see. So, from Manuel and from other interventions, one of the key points that was raised is the need to reformulate how we look at education. Um, in the mo for the most part, um, we have scenarios where education systems are not appropriate in training people for jobs that do not exist. They're not appropriate in understanding um, the, the evolving profile of needs, and this continues to be an ongoing concern. Of course, there are many other attempts at addressing this. Um, this is one of the points that Alexia from Plan Seibal pointed out, that Plan Seibal moved on from just a uh, basic uh, digital divide, um, matching technology with persons to an active um, research uh, initiative to see how to change the face of, um, of employment um, within the context of Uruguay. And there were initiatives in that um, country um, to address that where industry participated in the training of young, young people um, to meet um, future needs. And of course, um, just to summarize it all in this entire uh, issue, there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, the way we approach um, reconciliation of labor laws, the way we approach um, how platforms, uh, companies look at employment relationships, these are things that are always um, in motion and um, it requires a lot more um, work and understanding to understand um, get our heads around for in, in the first place um, classifications, how we could get organized and, and rethinking um, the traditional employer-employee relationship. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for coming.